espacio. Let the record reflect. We re reconvene with all members present, and uh, Maureen, Councilwoman Maureen Byrne is present virtually. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I ask you to remain standing after the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And please remain standing. We'll take a moment to Remember uh, people we lost over the last two weeks. Pat Wickens passed away on July 27th at the age of 88. She's survived by her husband, Al Wickens. Pat was a retired New York City school teacher. Avid gardener, devoted par parishioner of St. Vincent Martyr Church. And she and Al uh, were um, active supporters of the EPIC program and certainly um, I don't know exactly how long they've lived in Madison, but certainly well over 50 years. William Applegate, longtime Madison resident, passed away on July 25th. He was 75, born in New York City, October 1946. Married his beloved wife, Diane, on April 12, 1969. They lived in the Bronx before relocating to create a better life for the family in Madison 45 years ago. And he remained here for the rest of his life. His love, love for Madison was strong and ever present. He was preceded in death by his wife of 48 years, Diane, and survived by children, Brian, Billy, Lori, and Lori, one sister, Anne, and four grandchildren. And also, sadly, Richard McCory, the father of our newest firefighter, Luke McCory, died unexpectedly over the weekend. As Chief DeRosa shared, Richard was always supportive of Luke. He was clearly very proud when he heard that his son finally was achieving his dream of not only being a firefighter, but a firefighter in Madison. Luke was scheduled to start today. So let us take a moment to remember Pat Wickens, Bill Applegate, and Richard McCory, and let us pass our thoughts on to the families and friends they leave behind. Thank you. I may have a motion for the executive minutes of July 25th, 2022. So moved. Second. Second. Already been discussed. All in favor? Aye. 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 And a motion for the regular minutes of July 25th, 2022. So moved. Second. Second. Any um, <laughs> discussion? Any corrections? All in favor? Aye. 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 Welcome all. And, uh, we have a nice gathering here tonight. At our last council meeting two weeks ago, I had um, announced that the heat wave had broken. That was clearly short-lived. We've been hit. And uh, during this, uh, 
during the heat waves and this hot summer we've been hit with a few spot outages but uh, power has always been restored very quickly so I commend our uh, crews for always as staying, uh, maintaining our, our great grid on a sunny day so it's ready for the really hot days. Um, and a few things that's happened over the last two weeks. Uh, on Friday the 29th, we had our annual summer intern lunch for students that worked for the borough over the summer. As always, we had a great crew, hardworking and dedicated to their work. As, they, as I told them, they learn much from our staff, but we also learn so much from them. And um, while some may have, been deci have decided that a career in local government or in the area they worked is in their future, Others may have learned to go in a completely different direction. That's what being an intern is all about. So we want to thank them all. And on Saturday, July 30th, I attended uh, Touch a Truck, which a benefit put on by the friends of Madison Public Library. And one could tell by the smiles on the children's faces and the big crowd that a fine time was uh, had by all. Um, early reports indicated it was the most successful Touch a Truck yet, netting over $30,000, and the weather was perfect. Of course, last Tuesday was National Night Out with neighborhood gatherings and a great community uh, event on Waverly Place. Um, it was an amazing turnout downtown. Uh, almost everyone was in line for ice cream, but they all had a good time. So I want to thank our police fire, and fire departments, along with Volunteer Ambulance Corps and all those for making it a successful night. And it wasn't that hot that night. And on Friday, I uh, cut the ribbon for Kiss Me Kate and uh, for the Madison Public Theater, which is Madison's newest organization for cultural arts. So congratulations for, to Tom Selwood for the launch of Madison Public Theater and to Jackie Radcliffe on the production of Kiss Me Kate. While I was waiting to go up and cut the ribbon, I was going down memory lane looking at the uh, posters on the wall, which com commemorate all the high school productions over the years in 1974 which uh, I was a member of the class of 74, interestingly, was a uh, production of Kiss Me Kate. Uh, but for the record, I can't act, and I certainly can't sing, so I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> and the employee for the month of August, Thatcher Joe Minmeyer, has been selected for this honor. And during a recent shift, Joe's uh, intuition and attentiveness help facilitate a, a resident getting help with a mental health issue. Now I'm going to switch. So uh, periodically we uh, do a Mayor's Hero Award and this is for someone who has gone above and beyond and is truly been a hero. So I'd like to call Ann Berger up. And I think uh, your husband David's here. Come on up, or you, or you want to be photographer, whatever you, uh, yep. And I know also in the audience, and you can stay back there or come on up, Caitlin. And, and also Caitlin's uh, fiance, Evan. We'll you'll hear more about that in, in just a second. Hello, Evan. Your mother, Millie, good to see you, and uh, your garbage is being picked up? Okay. <laughs> we, we, we once in a while talk about that, so I want to... This is a very special award, and just to give you a little background on, on how so, someone's actions not only touch the person saved, but so many others, because my own family had an uh, incident similar to this. My brother, about five years ago, was out for a bike ride around mm -hmm. Lewisburg, Pennsylvania and in great shape um, didn't know that he had a ticking time bomb on his heart went down on the bike ride thankfully he went off the road and out of sight thankfully someone saw him go off the road they stopped started CPR and my brother is still with us today because of someone taking an initiative so this is what Ann did and this is why she is receiving our mayor's hero award she was driving right into town on June 3rd, and she noticed that something just didn't look right. And that happens so often, doesn't it? And very often people just say, oh, that didn't look right. Oh, and you, you turned around and went back and found a jogger had fallen and was in ca cardiac arrest. 
and here's some of our little connections here. His trainer had just recently taken a CPR class taught by Evan Webb, our firefighter. Who had, and uh, so he was well trained and had, become, had be, begun compressions. And you're a cardiac nurse. You took over when you arrived. The, the patient was revived and transported to the hospital where he was treated and released. And I believe that he is here today. Would you like to come on up? So this is Philip Dean, and you are here today because of Anne's heroic effort and that of others, the importance of being certified, but being a good Samaritan and acting. So on behalf of Philip and all of Madison, we present you with the Mayor's Hero Award, and as it says, for your emergent medical intervention saving a life on June 3rd, 2022. I mean, we've both been, we've been in contact since she came out of the hospital. We have heard that I just met his little wife for the first time, and I have a very friendship. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, <laughs> And we now move on to reports from committees. Council President uh, Landrigan, utilities. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Uh, from the Water Department, voluntary lawn watering restrictions are still in effect. Homes with even numbered addresses may water their lawns on even numbered days, and homes with odd numbered addresses may water their lawns on odd numbered days of the month. Watering is restricted to the evening and early morning hours of 8 p.m to 8 a.m. Watering during sun, sunlight hours wastes 50% of the water. The 623 fire hydrants are being painted this summer and will be tested and flushed in the fall when water use is low. The water system suffered two major water main breaks and one minor break the last week due to internal water hammer. The hammer was caused by improper use of the fire hydrant by outside contractors. The water department also responded to each break, isolated the broken pipe, made the necessary repairs, and returned the water system to normal operating conditions. Anyone interested in, ins in the installation of a radio readable water meter, please call the water department to make an appointment. Okay, from the electric department. They were very busy, so I'm just going to consolidate them a bit here. Between July 28th and August 4th, they responded to several down wires, marked many markouts for electrical service, took care of several spot power outages, and also responded to a transformer fire. And finally, the electric department would like to thank the three summer interns, Matt Monaco, Jean Notine and Patrick Quinn for the outstanding job they did during the summer in assisting their department. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And public safety, Ms. Byrne. Thank you, Mayor. From Chief John Misha, the police department, on August 3rd, 2022, we had our annual national night out, which was a huge success. This is the second year that Waverly Place was the main event location. The night brought several thousand to the center of town 
which provided hot dogs, ice cream, snow cones, and a bounce house, to name a few. We'd like to thank our partners from the Madison Fire Department, EMS, Road Administration, elected officials, New Jersey State Police, and local business who donated their time and resources were present. I'd like to thank the officers of the Madison Police Department who enjoy this night and more than anyone. Great time and looking forward to a 2023 National Night Out. On July 30th, Patrolman Cardenas and Capitalis attended Madison Touch a Truck with a patrol car and the emergency service unit at the Madison Area YMCA. The event, which supports the Friends of the Madison Public Library, was well attended. Lieutenant Pirelli and SRO Downs attended the Mars School Security Assessment Training and have been working with the district to continually improve security at our schools. Finally, also regarding police school security, Morris County Sheriff's Investigator Ashley Craig will be conducting a presentation of the RSDP3 reporting system virtually following the Madison School District Superintendent's coffee on August 22 at 7 p.m. The link for the virtual meeting link will be shared on social media. From the fire department. The fire department responded to a total of 99 calls in the month of July. 60 were fire related and 39 were medical calls. 77 fire prevention inspections and 28 smoke detector resale inspections were made. On Tuesday evening, July 26, at approximately 545, the fire department was dispatched to the area of Orlena and Fen Courts for smoke in the area. A large brush fire on the embankment along the railroad tracks was burning and mounted to be the cause of the smoke. Fire units had to have NJ Transit stop all train traffic in order to safely extinguish the fire. All fire units were clear of the track by 7.30 p.m., at which time train traffic was resumed. Early this past Friday morning, August 5th, around 3 a.m., our fire department responded to a mutual aid in Morris, Count Morris Township for a residential structure fire on Normandy Heights Road. This was a very large home, over 8,000 square feet, which was built back in the 1800s and was engulfed with fire when first responders first arrived on the scene. It was called into it was called into 911 by an airplane pilot that was headed into Newark Airport. Madison, along with many other departments and agencies, battled the fire blaze for many hours before bringing it under control. Madison fire units were released from the scene around 9 a.m. and replaced by a ladder truck from Parsippany. Sadly, the two elderly occupants of the home perished in the fire. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Community Affairs, Mr. Hoover. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> there is no report tonight, but I would like to call your attention to resolution on the consent agenda, resolution number 224, is 2022, which proclaims Saturday, October 1st, is Bottle Hill Day and authorizing a beer garden. We do need sponsors for the uh, Bottle Hill Day. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Finance Borough Clerk, Ms. Cohen. Thank you, Mayor. Before I get to uh, my report, I just wanted um, to publicize an event coming up September 10th, uh, right outside Hartley Dodge, that's a joint event between our Madison Borough, Chatham Borough, and Chatham Township, celebrating the diversity, um, both cultural and Community Cultural and Diversity Festival, celebrating cultures and diversity through multicultural performances, speakers, educational activity tables, celebrating cultural, mental health, LGBTQ+, educational diversity, and so much more. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me and um, or if you'd like to participate. On to the report. From the Tax Collector's Office, a reminder that taxes are due by the end of business this Wednesday, August 10th. The bills that were mailed out included a due date of August 1st, but there is a state mandated 10 day grace period. If your payment is received after the 10th, then you will receive interest penalties back to August 1st. Please contact the tax collector's office if you have any questions or need additional information. Several things from the finance department. The first is regards to um, our purchasing software that does our budgeting, purchasing accounts payable and tax collection admins, which is being ported over from a local server to um, the cloud to allow for enhanced cybersecurity and better backups. Um, same application, just cloud-based. The second topic involves interest on municipal deposits. As reported during the budget season, the drop in interest rates significantly impacted the interest revenue that the borough receives on municipal deposits. One item that is permitted to invest in is treasury bills, often known as T-bills. 
A T-bill is a short-term federal government bond with a maturity of up to 52 weeks. Our CFO has opened an account with the U.S. Treasury and is now purchasing T-bills directly from the federal government. T-bills that he purchased on behalf of the borough are generating annual interest of up to 2.8%, which will allow for additional revenue to help the budget. The third regarding electricity, which is huge, um, we, thanks to our CFO Jim Burnett, we purchased contracts for several years out. Uh, so we are currently paying less than $30 per megawatt hour on our, based on our average need. We cover 100% of that with these contracts. Uh, about an hour ago, he checked for me the spot market rate was $563 per megawatt hour. We have these contracts of $30 and below through the end of 2025, which covers average use, so we don't have to purchase for that. Um, and then we have uh, contracts out through 2029 that cover 50% of our average load. So kudos to him for saving us all a little bit of extra money as these prices go wacky. And then from administration, borough administration has been working with the various department heads on a plan to move certain offices in Hartley Dodge. Uh, one reason to make is to make room for the health department, which will be moving out of the Walnut Street building in the next eight weeks, so affordable housing can be built on that site. Second reason is uh, to make things a little more efficient, and so that similar departments with similar functions can uh, be placed closer together. So in the coming weeks, the tax collector's office will move upstairs to the finance and utility billing office. Both offices send out bills, collect revenue, and post payments to accounts. Therefore, it makes sense that they're near each other. The tax assessor's office will move up to the construction department, and the health department will be moving into the tax collector's office next to the clerk's office. Uh, it makes sense to have those two together because they both deal with licenses, meeting minutes, and vital records. More information on these moves will be posted on Rosenet and made public in the coming weeks. We appreciate everyone's patience and understanding as we make these moves. Thank you. Thank you. Public Works and Engineering, Ms. Ehrlich. Thank you, Mayor. I want to give a, a very quick update that's a bit of a coda to my uh, report last week on the Climate Action Committee's work in progress. There's big news on the federal front. Uh, you all might have heard that yesterday afternoon the Inflation Reduction Act passed the Senate, and this week we wait with anticipation for the House to adopt the bill and send it to the President's desk to be signed into law. I'm bringing this up because it's a historic bill that is going to be a, a huge deal for families, for communities, and for our planet. It will invest billions in deploying zero emission technologies to reduce greenhouse gas pollution and mitigate the worst impacts of climate change. And it is project projected to save families an average of $1,800 a year on energy costs. So now state, county, and local government leadership will be even more important. Now is the time to get engaged. There will be incentives to make real change possible at the municipal and the household level. But I want to point out that possible is different from actual, and the difference will rely on who and where we are ready to act. With goals, metrics, and a list of proposed actions for our department heads, administration, and council to consider, the Climate Action Committee is committed to helping the Borough of Madison and its residents be ready to benefit directly from the energy and cost savings provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act. So a report from engineering. The road improvement program is in full swing. Road milling operations started Thursday the 28th and were completed last Wednesday the 3rd of August. Paving began on Friday, August 5th and will be complete on Wednesday, August 10th. So far, Union Hill Road, Dwyer Street, Lee Ave, Lee Drive, half of Surrey Lane, Elm Street, Page, Wilmer Street, Howard Street, and Norman Circle have been completed, and our line striping contractor will restore pavement markings within the next week. Over at the MRC for construction of our new accessible trail, soil removal and disposal operations within the environmentally regulated area was completed last week. Clean fill and stone base has been imported to the site to begin restabilization work, and the fence will be relocated upon the restabilization of a 20-foot corridor and then made open for trail construction. Several members from the Environmental Commission, Shade Tree Management Board, and other committees walked with the borough engineer to observe the preliminary work in the cleared area. Clearing and grading of the overall trail alignment will, be, will continue in August. Report from the DPW. Uh, the DPW pitched in to set up and clean up after National Night Out last week, which was a great event. Public Works is cleaning up some of the perimeters in our various parks at the request of residents on adjacent properties. 
and the town arborist will be looking at a few parks to start a removal list for dead or dying trees at the perimeter. Pothole and blacktop repair is ongoing, and the DPW repaired Central Ave after a water main break that uh, Councilman Landrigan referred to. We had a total of three breaks, which uh, the DPW is investigating. Central Avenue in the area of house number 38 is still covered in gravel as we wait on Morris County to do a stormwater repair before the road is closed up. And the DPW is reviewing potential EV purchasing and exploring the viability of replacing older vehicles as suitable electric vehicles become available. The sewer department has cleaned and repaired all the catch basins within the mill and overlay road program for 2022. They've also started the yearly sanitary sewer cleaning. Please check rosenet.org and Madison social media for updates on sewer jetting locations and tips for avoiding sewer backups indoors. That's all for engineering and public works. Thank you. And health, Mr. Range. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Morris County's COVID-19 community level is currently high. And while it remains high, cases have trended downward over the last four weeks. As summer winds down and we start considering back to school and the start of the fall cold and flu season, you can take this opportunity this month to complete your or your child's primary COVID-19 vaccine series and or those recommended booster doses. All residents six months and older are eligible for vaccine with residents five and older eligible for a booster dose five months after their primary series. Those 50 and over are eligible for an additional booster dose four months after their first. On to another growing public health concern, monkeypox. We've seen a growing number of cases in the United States, um, and I think it was yesterday, the CDC uh, declared monkeypox a public health emergency. Uh, we've seen high concentrations of uh, monkeypox in New York City. Currently, New Jersey does not have a large number of cases, only totaling about 250 confirmed and probable cases. However, like we saw with COVID, Northern New Jersey's connection to New York City means cases are radiating east to west with Hudson, Essex, Bergen, and Union County seeing the largest number of cases. As of this morning, there were six confirmed cases in uh, Morris County. Monkeypox is primarily passed via close contact with an infected person, especially via skin-to-skin -skin contact. Monkeypox is not known to be airborne, nor is it considered a tra sexually transmitted infection. Limited supply of vaccine is being made available by the New Jersey Department of Health through community partners. Vaccine is recommended for the following groups. People who have a known contact with someone who has tested positive for monkeypox virus within the last 14 days. Those folks can contact uh, the Madison Health Department if you live in Madison to coordinate that vac vaccination. People who have attended an event where a known monkeypox exposure has occurred within the last 14 days can make an appointment at a community partner vaccine location. And those people who have a history of multiple or anonymous sex partners within the last 14 days, especially if they identify as gay, bisexual, men who have sex with men, and or transgender, uh, gender nonconforming or gender non-binary can make an appointment at a community partner vaccine location as well and those locations can be found on the New Jersey Department of Health's website. And lastly tonight, as mentioned in Councilwoman Cohen's report, the Health Department is working dil diligently to prepare to vacate the Walnut Street offices at the Civic Center later this month. So please bear with the Health Department as they make this transition over the next few weeks. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Now we'll move on to communications and petitions. Uh, the Borough Clerk's Office um, hasn't received any. So. And uh, now we're on to the first of two invitations for uh, public comment. We have a lot of new faces in the room, so uh, please listen to the guidelines here. This is limited to only the items on the agenda discussion and our resolutions that are listed for um, in, the, in the consent agenda. Uh, if you want to comment on the ordinances that are for hearing, you will do that when we open the hearings. If you want to comment on ordinances that are being introduced, you can do that in our second uh, comment period. And also, that, uh, that second comment period allows you to comment on any topic. Um, and these are the topics that we are uh, covering today in our discussion, agenda discussion, the Morris County Traction Line Pedestrian Walkway and Bikeway Trail. I have a presentation for the Morris County Park Commission. And then uh, these are the resolutions you may c comment on. Resolution 212 is awarding the uh, library roof restoration bid to MAC Group 
This is an amount of $456,758 and a uh, alternate bid of $39,800. These were both funded through ordinances 18-2017 and the ordinance 40-2022, which is having its second reading tonight. Resol uh, resolution 213 is authorizing a historic trust fund grant agreement for the restoration of the Masonic Lodge. And resolution 214 is amending resolution 244-2021, authorizing an additional $11,000 uh, contract with Montana Construction for storm sewer um, repairs completed on an emergent, emergency basis. And um, this is for the $11,000, the um, New Jersey Transit, which is responsible for part of that uh, un underground culvert, is reimbursing Madison for $30,000. Dollars and three thirty thousand three forty six. Uh, resolution two fifteen authorizing sale of surplus property no longer needed for public use on, on online auction website. Resolution two sixteen awarding contract to Allegiance Trucks for the purchase of international hook lift truck and accessories. This is um, due to supply chain issues and inc increase the amount to of $19,643, bringing the total to $277,593, funded through ordinance 41, 2018, and ordinance 24, 2021. Uh, resolution 27, or 217, ratifying the appointment, appointment of intern Matthew Ortiz, Ortiz as um, um, part of our um, new program, Madison High School, thank you Deb and others to making that happen. Uh, resolution 218 is appointing Jay Healy and Kurt Wilson to positions of substitute crossing guards. Resolution 219, approving special event permit to allow use of Memorial Park parking area by the adult school at Chatham's Madison Florham Park, and that's on uh, October 13th and October 19th. Uh, resolution 220 is issue, issuing a, or stating there is no objection to the issuance of a temporary Hellestop license for the Every 15 Minutes program at Madison High School. This is on March 27, 2023. This is the uh, bring heightened awareness to uh, uh, drinking and driving. Uh, resolution 221 is amending memorandum of understanding with the Borough of Chatham for styrofoam and food waste recycling. This is to expand access to the compost container, which right now it has limited access because it's at the recycling center. It will be relocated to the Kings Road parking lot. I think we only have eight families taking advantage of that. So it's seven besides the Conleys. It's a great program. And I forget to put my garbage out at night now. I don't worry because all the smelly stuff is being composted. So take a look at that. Resolution 222 is um, uh, Madison opposing proposed increases the state health benefits program. They have um, rolled out the potential of uh, increases above 20%, which is uh, certainly substantial. Resolution 223 is supporting a grant application to Morris County Parks uh, Commission to complete the traction line, pedestrian walkway, and bikeway trail, and that's uh, discussion to come on this. Resolution 224, as mentioned in uh, Council. When the Hoover's report is uh, procla proclaiming October 1st as Bottle Hill Day, authorizing the beer garden. Mark your calendars. Resolution 225 is approving the use of the community pool parking lot by the Cub Scout Pack 225 on September 9th. Resolution 226 approving raffle license by Madison uh, Rotary Club. Resolution 227 approving use of the uh, ice rink uh, field um, on October 8th and March 4th by uh, Cub Scout Pack 225, 226. Uh, resolution 228 is approving raffle license submitted by the Madison Education Foundation. So those are the resolutions you may comment on or the Morris County Traction Line uh, walkway. Also, if you want to wait until after the presentation, you'll be able to um, comment on the traction line after uh, that second comment period too. Anyone wishing to comment, please step forward. As you step forward, state your name, your address, and write the same on the slip. Uh, try to keep your comments to um, three minutes, but we give you a one minute grace and you'll be asked to stop at four minutes. Welcome, Claire. 
Hi, uh, Claire Whitcomb, 12 Fairwood Road. Um, I just want to say that I, I hope the council will not pass uh, a resolution on the traction line project today because um, the Environmental Commission, Shade Tree, and Sustainable Madison have not had a time chance to even discuss this in our own committees. There are a substantial amount of trees that will uh, be sacrificed for um, a pavement. And um, I don't, I hope to learn more from the presentation, but I don't clearly understand the need for um, spending $3 million to have a 3,200 foot uh, bike trail on when there are roads that can be easily accessed without danger. Um, I live on Fairwood Road. Our houses back up onto the track, and they would be on the other side of, of this project. And they, the, line, the, the Beach Avenue houses would be the ones whose backyards are deck, would be uh, abut county land and therefore would have um, significant tree removal. But it would also affect people on the other side of the track. And uh, as someone who's lived in this neighborhood for 24 years, I can tell you that trees are so important. They buffer noise. They um, make it OK to live right near the track. They buffer pollution. It, um, sh it adds privacy to your house. And we all know what happened when uh, New Jersey Transit did uh, tree clearing on Kings Road and what that did to the houses. Now, I don't know that this would be that dramatic, but the um, property is only 30 feet wide at certain points, and a 10-foot asphalt um, path would require, like, to do construction, you know, how much, how many trees are going to have to be taken out. And um, again, I think the arborists should review the setting. And for $1,000 a foot, I think we could do some amazing ecological restoration with native plants, remove these invasives, and find a, a use for that property that would protect uh, both the environment and uh, the population that abuts it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else wishing to comment, please step forward. Hi there. Uh, Daniel Perrigan, uh, 16 Kinney Street in Madison. Uh, I also wish, wish to speak about the uh, traction line. I am also very much opposed um, the uh, reasons given by the last person about the trees being removed is one of my main reasons. Um, the strip of land is only 30 feet wide that Madison owns, and to put a bike trail on that would, re would require demolishing uh, hundreds of trees, and many of these are old 80, 100-year-old trees uh, with trunks too big to put your arms around. Um, in addition to that, another concern I haven't seen brought up yet is the water. Right now, when it rains, the water goes into a trench between the tracks and the properties and soaks into the ground and eventually goes into our well systems. If this is paved, it becomes a non-permeable surface and the water has to run somewhere. A 30-foot wide strip, 0.62 miles long, for every inch of rain gathers over 61,000 gallons of water and that's going to have to go somewhere it's probably going to end up being pitched right into the backyards of the properties that abut the track. Uh, that's going to create swampy backyards and mosquito breeding grounds. So there's that in addition to the tree removal. And I think there's a much better way we can do uh, bike trails. Currently, we have the trail ending at Danforth. It's very easy and very safe to put in a bike trail from Danforth to Madison Avenue and lead the bicyclists right into the heart of Madison where they can access our restaurants and shops, which is exactly what we want them to do, instead of extending the trail just a few extra feet to get them to Elm Street, which doesn't help anybody. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. And um, hopefully in the re uh, presentation we'll have that they'll cover some of those uh, things you brought up. Uh, just to be clear, the, the property is not owned by Madison, but owned, owned by the county. Hello. My name is Mary Royer, and I live at 24 Cedar Avenue, and I'm on the corner of Cedar and Beach. And I want to rise to, you know, vehemently oppose the traction line extension. I totally agree with the people there. I went out today and counted the trees that would have to go down. 
that totally abut my property. There are 34 trees. 17 of them are large trees. We also have a problem with water. When it really rains, this is a dry stream bed that runs exactly next to my house, 15 feet from my house. The water comes there and it goes down, it goes down to the catch basin that is the, right at the end of my property, borough catch basin. If we pave this, all that water is going to come into my in, dry, come into my driveway, come to my backyard and flood it. Now, if you put berms up, then you're just going to have that water just stream on there. You've got a real big problem with erosion, flood control, and also the privacy of the people who live on beach and my, on, on cedar. This is a terrible idea. And it would lower the value of our houses considerably to have something. And you're going to have to put privacy fences on top of these things. You don't want you kids and your grandkids playing in the backyard with everybody and their brother coming along. I was robbed in 1981. And the Madison police told me that this came from the, along the train tracks. They came in from there. If putting this there is just a way for you to get more people looking in the back of your yard, seeing what you have, seeing what your kids are doing, and I totally oppose it. Anyone else wishing to be heard? My name is uh, David Lloyd. I'm related to Mary by Marriage. Mary, it's good to see you again. I know you like to see me every couple of years yep. talk about the traction company. Always good to see you. I think this is the third time. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I can't wait for the presentation, uh, and, and I can't wait to hear how much the third time around costs. Okay, the last time was three million. The first time was a half a million. And this council at that time had the good wisdom not to proceed. Um, I have previously written to the borough council and the mayor. It was uh, apparently around Monday, January 25th, 2021. Uh, since that time, I was pleased to hear the Shade Tree Commission's views. I certainly mentioned that in my letter. And I'm referring to that letter, and I plan to circulate it again so that you can move on with the meeting. But I feel very strongly about the points that I made. I don't think they are frivolous. I think that uh, at least the second time around, the uh, Morris County Parks Commission treated the neighbors with the back of their hand. I would hope for better relations and explanations from the Morris County Parks Commission this year and not hide in their building. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Kathleen Cacavalli, 82 Central Avenue. Um, I'm very interested in hearing the presentation. I think there are environmental concerns about the traction line. And we'll see which, you know, weighs in better the benefits or the, but I just want to comment to comments that were made by other people about property values and privacy and crime. So this is something that I've tracked for, for quite a while. And the National Association of Realtors, who I don't think would say it if it weren't true, <laughs> I just want to read a quote from them. Property values are of utmost importance to homeowners and living near a park trail or greenway may, is certainly something to take into consideration. The good news is that recent studies have confirmed living near trails and greenways will likely raise your property value an average of 3 to 5 percent, and sometimes even as <clears throat> high as 15 percent. And there were another 20 studies that say the same thing. And they also go on to say there is also no correlation that trails increase crime in their surrounding areas. So I just wanted to put that on the record. Anyone else wishing to comment? Hi, Mary Wilson, 27 Sherwood. 
I wasn't coming here to speak about this tonight, but I ran into an old friend, and he told me about it, and I just wanted to share. I was a kid who grew up with a train track in my backyard, and we were stupid, and I'm glad I'm still here. We did all sorts of stuff, and as many bar physical barriers that you can put between a kid, a stupid kid, and a train track, the better. So I, environmentally, it's important to keep the trees here, but I would also implore you for the safety of kids, stupid kids, please let the trees remain. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Dave Wardeglair, 12 Kenny Street. Um, my parents purchased the property here at 12 Kenny Street in 1967. My dad demoed the old house there and moved the house from Lorraine Road to that new property, which we live today. We've been there over 40 years. When he did that, he planted a borderline of pin oak trees along the back end of that property as a buffer for the railroad. Them trees are now over 50 something years old, 90 feet tall, and it's a beautiful buffer that runs across the back of the property. They will definitely be affected by this, especially with the construction and getting bulldozers in there to fill in that, that culvert that Dan was speaking about, which always drains water out. Last September, I have a video of the September 1st storm, that hurricane that came, that flood that came, it filled that back end up about two and a half feet. It took about two days for that water to perk down through there. If that, that whole upper part of Center Street, the Fairwood section, that's all perk going through under the railroad, catches that culvert, and which eventually goes back into the aquifer. This project's gonna destroy that and you're gonna have a lot of problems with people's private property and the environmental impact of them, all them trees along there. It's too much of a beautiful strip of land to destroy like this for a short piece of uh, bike trail. I'm all for biking, but there's gotta be a better way. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Seeing none, I close this part of the meeting. We now go on to our uh, agenda discussion. Call up um, Denise Chap Chaplick to uh, make a presentation. Welcome, Denise. You're at the end. Good evening. I'm Denise Chaplick. I'm with the Morris County Park Commission. I'm the Director of Park Planning and Development. I take on projects such as the traction line extension to plan, design, construct. Um, and I'm joined tonight by a longtime Commissioner Seabury, Richard Seabury. Um, he was instrumental in purchasing the property and uh, to develop the entire trail. And he'll speak a little bit about that after I'm finished. But um, I didn't expect for a resolution to be passed this evening. I was basically um, bringing you up to speed as to where we are and to have a discussion about where we are with the project. And that's basically what my presentation is tonight. So um, yeah, that, that was one of our questions, if it, it was necessary timing wise and all that. So, so. No, uh, it's not necessary for you to pass a resolution today. And I'll, I'll talk more okay. about what some of our next steps are in this Sounds process. Good. So we will uh, we'll take official action when we have the presentation, but most likely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You need more. Hold, hold the resolution. Absolutely. There are definitely, as I, from my, what I heard this evening, more discussion to happen. Um, it's been two years since we talked about this project. so. Uh, we have some advancement, I'll say, and we wanted to come uh, tonight to kind of share those details with you. But also, I want to give a little bit of background to the project itself, and I'm going to turn around so I can see what, what you just, just as long as you're... Um, there's, yeah. And I apologize to the people at home. You're going to see my back. I'm just going to hold this. Is that okay? 
Okay. Um, this is the traction line looking east, exactly uh, where the trail currently ends. Um, and, you know, we basically, it dumps you onto Danforth, and there's not a whole lot of options once you get to Danforth. Next slide. Uh, so overall, the corridor is a five-mile corridor that parallels NJ Transit from the Morristown line between Morristown and Madison. Uh, the Morris County Park Commission has owned the property since 1981, and it has always had the intended use as a recreational trail and non-motorized transportation link. Uh, the traction line is one of the only rail with trails in New Jersey, and that basically means that the trail parallels the active line. So this is a very unique feature within our state. Um, the other thing I want to uh, just briefly touch on, uh, the traction line is also very special from other bikeways in that it provides a high level of comfort to all different ages of cyclists. Not everyone is comfortable riding on the road, riding on a sidewalk. So this is a very special facility in that it is separate from auto traffic and that, again, that high level of comfort to all ages. Uh, next slide. Just a little bit of background. Phase one, which starts over in Morristown at Morris Ave. Um, excuse me. That was constructed in 1986, uh, the 2.6-mile segment from Morris Ave to Convent Station. And then phase two came in 1997 with another one mile added to that from Convent to Danforth, and that's where we, where we are today. Both of those phases were funded with federal dollars, or um, initially when all of these federal dollars became available, you might have heard them referred to as ICT funding. Today they're referred to as TAP, Transportation Alternative Programs. So these federal programs are encouraged by um, these federal programs and, and funding. Uh, and that's where we are today. Phase three is, as you all mentioned, another just under a mile, and we're looking to go between Danforth to Elm. Uh, and just this graphic shows you that last red section is the proposed just under one mile. Next slide. Okay, uh, just an overview. The entire corridor will come, come together to be of five miles. As I mentioned, it's owned by the Mars County Park Commission, and it ha it's been a long-term plan to implement this in a phased structure. Um, so that's, that's been the intention all along. And there's ever-increasing demand for this kind of facility uh, for access to non-motorized most modes, whether it be economic choices not to drive, fuel cost, um, environmental conditions, reducing congestion, air pollution, improved health. I, I mean, I can go on and on about the benefits of a non-motorized transportation option. Next slide. Um, I like to get into the weeds a little bit. Uh, in many of our park facilities, we do counts. You might have seen these little boxes. You, it looks like a camera. This one on the traction line happens to be in three different locations. Uh, but if you see, uh, the top line is at the Danforth, uh, and the middle one is at Con and Punchbowl. And then on the bottom there is the western end at Morris and Con. And this basically tells you how many people are using this facility, which is pretty eye-opening eye uh, once we started to get a real look at what's happening. This happens to be from last year, 2021. And on an annual basis, uh, in total, the, the most highest usage is coming out of Con and Punchbowl. And that makes most sense because that's where the new development is from Honeywell. And, and those are just growing and growing in this area. So these numbers will continue to climb. But you'll see Danforth has the lowest volume because 
it terminates, it comes to an end. Everyone doesn't want to extend all the way down to Danforth because it doesn't really go anywhere. So we totally anticipate that as this connectivity grows, the number will grow uh, in usage as it moves east. Um, these are, some, as I mentioned, some pretty impressive numbers in March. March is a real uh, high point for usage. That's where everybody's coming out of hibernation after winter. Um, so that's a high point you'll see uh, for uh, the Morris and Khan section, as well as the Khan and Punch Bowl. Next slide. Whoa, that's hard to look at. Um, this is just a tracking of uh, the volumes over the years. You'll see the location at Danforth at the top is one of our longest collected locations since 2018. And you, you can see uh, the numbers grow. And I'm so glad we had these counters in place during COVID because it showed a tripling in some locations of usage <clears throat> during the, the lockdown, which was, I mean, you all remember, people were crawling all over each other to get out there and get on the trails. Um, so we have some really valid numbers of the usage here. And, you know, as I said, 2020, we, we were kind of off the charts with a, a doubling and tripling. Uh, 2021, uh, we're slightly down from COVID numbers, but still above 2019. So people have continued their patterns of use, which is great. I'm not going to get too much further into weeds other than to say, if you look at these annual totals, we have uh, nearly 100,000 people using the traction line. That's pretty impressive. Next slide. So phase three, um, you know, we came to, to Madison and the council back in 2012, as, as some of you have mentioned. Uh, we were seeking funding to advance phase three. Um, and unfortunately, the, the borough didn't endorse the project at that time, so we, the Park Commission, did not continue to seek grant funding. At that time, the project was estimated about $550,000 back in 2012. Um, next slide. So eight years later, um, what, the last time I, I spoke to, to uh, the council and I believe it was the uh, open space committee. Uh, I did a very similar presentation back in 2019 and 2020. We had identified another potential funding source to advance phase three. Uh, and at that time we did successfully uh, receive an endorsement from you and thank you very much for, for uh, providing that to us. But unfortunately, the funding was not approved. It was not a priority for funding from that funding source that we sought at, back in 2020. Uh, next slide, please. So two years later, here I am again. I have found, we have found another funding source, a federal funding source, uh, which comes through the DOT. And it's called the Transportation Alternative Set Aside Program of 2023. Um, and right here in this little blurb at the bottom tells you the different eligibility uh, items that could be funded through this particular source. Sidewalks, walkways, curb ramps, bike lanes, shoulders, uh, bike parking, and number five, new or reconstructed off-road trails bike and pedestrian bridges and underpasses. So this is a perfect fit for this project, we think. Um, so uh, the next, basically this funding would uh, look at both design and permitting. And I know you all have touched on many different factors that would be addressed in design. And one in particular is the stormwater. Right now, there's virtually nothing being addressed with the stormwater, and it sounds like there's a culvert that's not functioning there. So in, with this particular project, it would look to resolve the existing flooding issues, and the stormwater would be designed as part of the project. Um, it would not cause further flooding. It would probably address and solve the existing issues that you're seeing out there. Um, and in terms of, you know, stormwater management, uh, this particular, 
again, it hasn't been designed, but um, the design features can, in fact, use porous pavement where the, the stormwater management would be stored on site and retained and, and not do like a, a roadway with sheet flow that oftentimes sees adjacent flooding. So again, all of these th factors have not been designed and addressed, but can be incorporated into the design in addition to um, the buffering and fences. And I'll, I'll touch on that in a, in a second, but each year we, we put this off, it gets more and more expensive. Um, you know, and one of the most expensive components is the clearing of the site. The site has been overgrown um, with infill trees. And basically, uh, in our very early and initial cost estimates, half of the cost is for clearing the trees because we're in a very constrained corridor. We have a, an active train line on one side and residential properties on the next. And that is going to have to be handled with a specialized tree removal company that is certified by NJ Transit. And that just drives the cost up. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we're, we're estimating that the tree removal is nearly half the cost. So because of those very restrictive limits, um, that's what's pushing that cost up. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, our next steps are to look at submitting this grant application that's due in the fall, um, obtain letters of support, um, provide a description of the overall grant in terms of the benefits, the usage numbers I was showing you in terms of the counts a minute ago, update our cost estimate. And unfortunately, this uh, funding source that we're going after only award, their cap is about 1.5 million. So the Park Commission would still need to um, add in additional dollars to come up to the full one, or excuse me, three million. So we'd have to put in almost half of those dollars um, because there is a cap on, on this funding source that we've identified right now. Um, next, uh, next slide, please. I just wanted to give you some highlights of what this phase three, this corridor looks like. Uh, many folks have already mentioned this, that um, sections of it is 30 feet, but the majority of it is 40 feet wide, which is what the existing cross section looks like. Um, the extensive, as I mentioned, extensive clearing and debris removal would be needed. Um, this has become a bit of a dumping ground. Uh, with landscaping and, and other things um, that you'll see there. Uh, several properties have encroached into the right-of-way, and um, none of it seems to be, you know, any, nothing that we couldn't overcome. There's some sheds and fences, um, nothing insurmountable, but uh, we've dealt with this in other projects, and basically things are relocated as uh, the, the project is built. Fences are relocated on the property line. Buffers and fencing are incorporated into the design. Um, and of course, we'll uh, coordinate with local connections at the Kinney Street Park and, and Elm Street. As I mentioned, this has not been designed. So there's many details to resolve and dot the I and cross the T. So right now, we're, we're looking to fund the project. It's uh, we can't really get it off the ground until we, we do that. Um, this scale of a project is really out of the hands of coming directly from uh, solely funded by the Park Commission, so we have to seek these larger uh, pots of dollars. Uh, the intention is to maintain the existing cross section, uh, and uh, the folks mentioned before, it is 10 feet wide. Uh, it does have existing shoulders of about two to three feet. And that is built to a national standard. Just like a roadway is built to standards in terms of the lane width and shoulders, trails are also built to a standard, and, and that's what it is. So that's the guidance that we follow. Um, of course, we'll uh, be coordinating with adjacent property owners, as I talked about, in, in uh, removing and mitigating 
uh, any encroachments and buffers. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's, it's been a significant increase in the project cost from the 2012 estimate, and uh, unfortunately. Uh, next slide, please. This is the corridor coming through the Danforth area. Uh, the, the orange sections are uh, properties that are immediately touching that trail. Um, I don't have a full count, but I just wanted to give you a visual of, of um, what touches this section. Uh, there's probably 30, I would say 30 to 50 as, as a rough guess. Uh, and here's a, a photo of what that existing cross section looks like and what the anticipated section uh, in this piece moving east would look like as well. Next slide. I just want to remind uh, everyone that this trail has been a good neighbor for many years since, what, 1986? I mentioned that first phase was developed. Uh, so it's proven itself to be a good neighbor. Those, the numbers of uh, people using the trail reinforce the need and interest in this facility. Um, next slide. And again, there's solutions to being a good neighbor. Um, the fences, the buffering, and this is just an example of the people who've taken on um, the connections and, and making it a, a positive. And, uh, there was another person here tonight about the increased pop property values. That is proven over and over and over again. And even in your local listings, you'll see, oh, it's you know in the neighborhood of the trail, and it's a selling, huge selling point. But um, next, I think that's my last slide. Yep. Um, again, we well, switch over to the other side yes. so I can handle questions from the council. Yes. Thank you, Denise and. Uh, you're welcome. An update. Just uh, you, you talked about a fall uh, time schedule. What, what is the? At what point do you need us uh, support? The deadline for the funding source for the grant that we're looking at is November third. So I, I would hope that we could have um, a decision and even additional letters of support from other entities um, in addition to to the council as well. So that's the deadline we're working with. I think I'm the, the lone person here that has been here for all three presentations. Okay, so, okay. But uh, so thank you, and I, I had commented on on how the uh, neighborhoods had a lot of the neighbors embraced the um, the trail with putting in their own gates, and you'll see that same thing if you uh, for those in Madison, if you walk from um, Memorial Park to Del Barton Drive, you'll see the same thing there where people have put gates in, in, in their, uh, mm -hmm. to access the trail. So uh, that's certainly a, a, a proven point. Um, just to, uh, on the, so it's a 10 foot width, but with the shoulders, you're talking, is it 16, you know, three on each side? So basically 16 out of the 30 to 40 feet, is that, would that be the? More or less, yeah. Yep. Um, More or less, that would be the developed right. section of things. And um, you know, just as the Woodland Avenue um, bike path that heads to Lawanica kind of weaves its around mm -hmm. way around trees, especially mm -hmm. in that 40-foot area. Um, I, and I know we haven't even gotten close to doing any, any engineering, but some significant trees could be incorporated with a slight bend here and there. To uh, certainly, certainly, and you know, as I mentioned, the the standards um, is eight feet, but there are exceptions, engineering exceptions, that if we did need to uh, narrow down the trail, we could certainly do that in select locations. And then related to safety, uh, how high is the fence between the uh, existing trail now and the railroad? It's probably about eight feet high. I, I, I'm working with NJ Transit, and that's typically the height they prefer to be integrated with uh, any adjacent active lines. I will now hand it off to, <laughs> yep, Bob. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, is any of that land all along the trail owned by New Jersey Transit? Not outside of our right of way. I mean, they're immediately next to us, but the section that the trail is in and this phase three that I referred to, this is all the Park Commission okay. property. And now when you talk about encroachment, 
And you mentioned that some homeowners had to move sheds and probably fences. Mm -hmm. Who does that cost fall on to, to move that? That would be part of the project. So the project would cover the cost for that homeowner to do that? Yes. Okay. Um, in regards to safety, I used to live in that neighborhood, so I'm very aware of things that have happened on that trail. Is there any thought to possibly improving safety on that trail? I know in recent history there have been a number of possible, I think somebody was assaulted on it. Plus at night it's dark, at dusk mm -hmm. there's no lights on it. Mm -hmm. Is there any thought to putting lighting on that trail? No. no. And for a couple of reasons. Um, all of our parks are dusk to dawn, mm -hmm. so they shouldn't be operating in uh, nighttime hours. Or dawn to dusk. I'm sorry, did I, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Just for the record there. Sorry. Thank you. That's what I meant. Um, you know, otherwise, we would be putting lighting in, right? Okay. Um, and it's not typically a feature that we include on our trails. And I'm certain none of the neighbors would really appreciate nighttime lighting. Well, in you the could backyard. also position the lights to shine down mm. and away from the homes if you really wanted to do it. Um, it's not being considered uh, largely because of the op okay, could hours of operation. Out that you've mentioned, instead of extending the trail, be used to clean it up? Because some of your pictures are very accurate. I mean, people have mm -hmm. dumped things on it, the fence is broken. Rather than extending the existing trail, could it be used to clean, clean up the trail, fix the fences, clean it up a bit? and maybe repave some of the areas where I can see from that picture it's cracked? Um, the funding would not be eligible to do that. Okay. And then I guess that I'll end after this one. Um, well, I have two more quick ones. At the end where you were saying it would end, would end at Elm Street, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you're saying that bicycle riders then would go down there and shop in Madison or potentially go shopping within Madison. Because that's what we're really looking for. What benefit would it bring downtown? Now, if I'm riding a bicycle, I don't know if I'm just going to stop downtown to shop. You might eat. You might get a drink. You might... <laughs> okay, I hear you. Um, your chart showed that our end of it is the least used. Mm-hmm. I was wondering if any studies been done to show where the most usage is, it's the most densely populated area, meaning I would suspect down at the Morristown, at the first part of it, mm -hmm. there's more people, and it would go down as you get into the Madison part. So that could be run, one reason why it's low, not because it terminates at Danforth. And then I guess my final comment it is, would there be any thought to where the trail ends at Danforth, just making a turnaround so people could go back? rather than extending it and going down Elm Street, which is, you know, almost like the path to nowhere. Um, I'm sure that could be looked at and considered, but that's not the intent of, okay. of phase three. And I just want to recognize Commissioner Seabury, if, if you wanted to add anything yeah, into this. Um, you have been part of the project since the JC, JCPNL donated the property to the Park Commission in 81. Uh, my name's Richard Seabury, uh, lifelong resident of Mars County, 85 years, and I'm looking for another 15 or 20, uh, and I'll get it. Uh, I, uh, I've been a Park Commissioner for 52 years, and my heart, believe me, has been in it, and I've spent many, many hours, and I've uh, been right, and I've been wrong. And uh, I took a few minutes tonight to ride around in the area. I'm familiar with it. In fact, Christmas time, I took my daughter and her kids, grandchildren, they were up from Florida, and we walked from the uh, station back towards Marstown. So I, I'm I've been a participant on the trail. Uh, I, I like maps, old maps, and uh, I uh, dug out, uh, re recently Park Commission was donated uh, one of the Beers uh, 1868 uh, folios. 
It was in Willis's barn there in Booton Township. Um, I made a copy for you, two pages, and I looked at what Madison looked like in 1868, as well as what Montville looked like, my hometown, and others. And I'll leave that with you. And um, the park, I took this over to uh, our historical group, and they uh, digitized it. Uh, so we don't have this hundred and some year old map tacked on the wall. And we got it on a thumb drive. And uh, I'm going tomorrow over to uh, Pompton, uh, to Quantic, and the, they're interested in blowing it up and doing something in the municipal building. So I'll leave this with someone. The clerk will take that. Yep. And uh, we can make a big one. <laughs> um, I, I, a little bit of the history. Uh, the, many years ago, uh, about, I think it was in the 80s, I talked to a recruiter. They were looking for tests, that they could test people who were interested in government positions of leadership and corporate. And he said, our brains are wired in such a way that it's easy to live in the present. You, the problems you have right now, what we're doing, this is, we're in the present. And uh, everybody's brain is pretty good on that. Now, there are fewer wires when it comes to history, looking backwards. And certainly the people who look, look at what happened in history do better because there are lessons to be learned, just like that map. I, I like to look at the maps and see what was done. And now the future. That's the toughest, and there are fewer wires in our brains that uh, uh, make us interested in the future or even want to do something about it. And what's this guy, Eldon Musk, and people like that are devoted entirely for the, the future. So I have to sit there and it, it, hopefully I got enough wires to handle all these. Uh, and I want to talk about an executive, and a, uh, he was a neighbor of yours, and a Booten boy, Jim Leva. Jim Leva was a Booten boy. He started out as a, a, a lineman for Jersey Central Power and Light, and he worked his way up. He was president of Jersey Central Power and Light. Some of you may remember Jim. Um, he was also mayor of Morris Township, and he was mayor back in the days that we were getting started on the trail. And there were unhappy people along that trail. They, were, they, they didn't want it. And uh, Jim and his council looked ahead and uh, uh, su supported the concept and supported the, the trail starting right there at George Washington's headquarters and down on the first section. Uh, we, thinking ahead, park commissioners, we knew that that one section, that last uh, mile or so, uh, we didn't own it. And it made sense that this should be attached and uh, it would be an important element to finalize the trail. So I saw in the paper where Jim was retiring from Jersey Central Power and Light and the diocese uh, was going to have a dinner at the Governor Mars, $100 a chicken, $100 was went a little further in 1980. So uh, I said, you know, that's the time to talk to Jim. He had one week and he's out of there. We had one week. So uh, I moved a little faster than I normally do. I said to Quentin, do you think the Park Commission can fund a $100 ticket? I didn't want to do it. I was willing to buy the drinks. We don't pay for the drinks. So uh, yes, so I went over and uh, Jim was there first. He was standing outside the door of the ballroom. I went over and talked to him. I said, I'll get you a drink. So uh, he shook hands with everybody coming in there. He was, he was, he was a politician as well. And uh, uh, they dimmed the lights, and everybody headed into the banquet. And I walked over to him, and I said, I'll walk you up to the dais. And we talked about the trail and how successful it had been, and we appreciated his support. And I said, you own that last stretch along the line. Would the 
would you consider as one of your last acts here as president of the company donating that to the park commission and he said yes it's, it, it should happen let's i'm looking ahead you should have it so uh, he gave me his card and he wrote the name and the telephone number of the real estate manager for jersey central power he said you call him monday and we'll get right on this and we ended up getting well not free cost us a hundred dollars for that ticket we got the donation from Jersey Central Power and Light. And he was the kind of guy who uh, was very effective in the present. He was well-wired. He certainly could look behind him and look at history. And he looked ahead as an executive. And uh, he saw the need for the extension of that trail. So on that, I'll sit down. I think my three minutes is up. <laughs> as a speaker, you get more than three. but. And, and just to just to fill in um, a little more on the uh, the, the pasts, as uh, some people may not be aware, the traction line was the Morris County uh, Traction um, Company trolley line that ran parallel to the tracks from I believe from Morristown to Summit. Did it run that far? I think, and mainly provided stops in between the um, Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western uh, Railroad stops. So it, it ran along that, the actual traction line, and I believe then went down Elm Street because it ran down Park Avenue. I remember as a childhood when Park Avenue get repaved, you'd see the rails reappear once in a while, and then down uh, Main Street. So this was, that's how this little corridor was created and why you have that extra arch under the railroad at, um, at, da at Danforth. You have a clear, the clearance for the uh, tracks, and you have the clear clearance for the... Um, uh, tr traction line, and that bridge, I think, was put in the 1950s. So, quick, quick history. But Bob, you covered your uh, question. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, yep. Ma Maureen, do you, or I can come back to you if you. Uh... No, no, I'm fine. Um, I I appreciate uh, what the um, community members have had to say and their concerns. I share some of their concerns, mostly about uh, losing trees and aquifer recharge. Um, but I think it's a good idea, and I think we should spend a little bit more time uh, exploring the idea. Thank you. John? Thank you. Yes, uh, first of all, excellent presentation. Good overview, good history, good look at the, at the whole project. My concern is, why is it, first of all, I don't know how it got on our agenda as a resolution item tonight, but I, would, I think I agree with Claire that it probably ought to be vetted by some other groups in town, like shade tree management, you know, like uh, park, parks advisory, and some others, mm -hmm. perhaps. And then we can take a more serious look at it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm not opposed to the project generally, mm -hmm. you know, but I would like to get their input on this as well. Sure, we'll be glad to collaborate in more detail. Yeah. Um, thank you for the presentation. I am familiar with the traction line because my son, that's where they ran for track practice when okay. he was a track athlete at the high school. Um, I do share, I think the biggest concern is the tree loss. We're actually looking how to plant more trees and how to save our trees and save the tree canopy. So the thought of tearing down sure. probably 50 or more trees, if you know, is just, it's a hard pill to swallow without saying, oh, well, we'll put more in here mm -hmm. so i think that's a big concern um looking at the numbers michael if you can go back to the slide that has the the three locations from 2018 to 2021 you know, i think we have to discount 2020 i don't think i think it's just too much of an abnormality as to what people were doing i know my husband and i walked a thousand times more than we do now um, and we did before, but if you look at the, so if you look at 2019, I'm gonna leave 2018 out since that's, there only seems to be the one at Danforth there. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a slight increase between 2019 and 2021 at Danforth. There is a huge jump in that middle section uh, at Punchbowl. And then there's actually a pretty decent drop off um, from 2019 to 2021 on that third location. So. The counters are great, and I actually appreciate being able to see this, but I just, 
I have to wonder, while we would love to say that people are going to be walking more and biking more, is that reality if we extend it? Will they be using that part? Because as has been pointed out, ending at Elm is not a great road to bike down. Um, and you end up either on Park um, or at, you do end up at the light at, at 124 Madison Ave. Um, so just my personal take on the numbers. And then another concern, you mentioned New Jersey Transit would have to approve whoever does the tree removal. Um, and I think the big concern is what did happen uh, over on Kings Road where, I don't know if it was Transit or JCPNL or PSCG, I don't know who did it, but they basically clear cut. Mm -hmm. Um, and who's going to oversee so that if, if this w gets approved, that it is only the 50 trees that need to come down and they don't clear cut. The next thing we know, there's 100 trees that have come down. So I get it. I love the idea of a safe space for people to bike. I like the idea somebody threw out, and um, I think it's going to come up again, of possibly going up Danforth, which isn't the traction line, but that that's, that almost makes a little more sense. But I just think there's, a, there's many environmental concerns, as far as I'm concerned, with it. And then we need you know, the oversight and that sort of thing. Rachel. Denise, thank you for the presentation. It was very illuminating. And like Deb, I'm very glad to see the pedestrian data. Although I take a different interpretation of it, I think that uh, we have to expect that people are going to be doing less motorized travel, more walking, more biking. In fact. Uh, our future relies on people transitioning away from uh, private automobiles and using bikes, walking, other forms of e-mobility. Um, speaking as the chair of the Climate Action Committee, we are committed to encouraging uh, the, the reduction of what we call vehicle miles traveled, VMT, to um, get away from the emissions of greenhouse gases from cars. So uh, I, I'll mention that the council received um, dozens of emails in support of a bike connection between Madison and Morristown. Uh, the idea of cyclists traveling in two ways to visit our shops or our cafes and, and vice versa to Morristown is very exciting to me as a cyclist. Our son just learned to ride his bike and uh, he learned on the traction line. So, you know, it was a safe, wide, asphalt paved area that our seven year old could, you know, mm -hmm. safely navigate. So I'm uh, excited about the possibilities of this. I'm um, intrigued to hear that stormwater management using green infrastructure could be incorporated into the project because I think that would address and mitigate existing flooding issues, help us recharge our aquifer in a managed way, and beautify that strip, which seems to be a real uh, grab bag of different you know, conditions right now, whether it's overgrown, uh, planted with trees that homeowners have planted over the years or been a dumping ground. Um, I think, you know, creating a, a beautiful vegetated buffer with green stormwater management is a beautiful idea for that area. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, like others, I'm concerned about the loss of mature trees. We're, we're fighting tooth and nail to preserve our tree canopy in, here, in Madison, so that's going to be an important mitigating factor to consider. Um, I understand, thanks to you know, your preamble, that um, there's no set plans at this time to complete this. There's no funds in place. Um, and what you're doing is ask, asking impacted towns if they would support uh, applying for a grant to study and potentially fund the project. So I think that's um, important to note that that's you know, what you're going to be seeking in the coming months. Um, and that uh, should this go forward, there'll be lots of opportunities to comment and to help refine the plans, mm -hmm. especially with the input of our many volunteer committees in town. So thanks again for coming before us. This has been a great start to the conversation. Eric. Thanks, Bob. Um, I was probably one of those early 1997 Danforth people when I was a student at FDU, and the traction line really gave those students a uh, gateway up to uh, Convent Station and, you know, obviously Morristown and, and New York City after that. Obviously also very grateful for the work that Morris County has, has done on our prior trail projects here in Madison. Um, and like others, I'm uh, certainly in favor of dedicated bike and pedestrian facilities uh, separated from vehicular traffic as a safety issue. Um, so certainly at the headline level, you've got me. Um, 
that said, uh, and my council colleagues will probably groan at me saying this again, uh, the devil's in the details, right? Absolutely. Um, so I'm gonna, since some of my questions have been hit on already, I'll try to breeze through these as quickly as I can. Um, obviously, uh, we don't have a design yet, so we don't, we don't know what we don't know uh, mm -hmm. on some of this stuff. Um, so should we at some point down the road uh, pass a resolution supporting the design and construction for this grant if there are um, what I'll call deal-breaking elements that come out of that design phase, um, is it possible for us to withdraw our support and kind of pump the brakes? Or once we get that DOT funding, we're on the hook for the for the full Monty all the way down to construction, even if there is something that may be a deal breaker for us. That's a lot uh, in, in <laughs> one go, uh, a lot of what ifs. Um, of course you could rescind your support if there's something along the lines um, that you're uh, dissatisfied with. Um, the funding sources, uh, like we're talking about here, the, the DOT funds are on a reimbursable basis. Um, so, um, you know, I, I don't think that there would be anything that couldn't be resolved. Um, it's, it's very unusual to give back a grant at this scale. Um, let me just say that we would work very hard to make everything um, acceptable and amenable to the borough. Um, these sorts of funds are very highly competitive, um, so it's not something we would want to jeopardize. Sure. Um, so we would work very hard to make sure all parties are, are um, Great. happy with the solutions. Thank you. Um, I just want to also get a clarification on the length of the proposed project. On In the slides, it says nearly a mile, um, but I think it's 0.6 miles. I think you're probably right. Okay. I, I, um, I'm, I'm rounding up for simplicity's sake. Deviled in detail. Um, yeah, devil's in the details. <laughs> um, yes, I think you are probably right. I'm, I'm rounding up to, to uh, simplify things. Uh, so based on that, you know, little over a half a mile, um, it's about 1.1 acres of trees and vegetation that will come down as a result of this. this <coughs> um, that's my quick back of the napkin with the help of Google Maps there. Um, and those trees, and I walked along Danforth for a little bit and along Kinney, um, are maples and oaks and poplars, the exact trees that uh, we want, although despite some uh, uh, Japanese knotweed in some of those pictures there. Uh, most of what's along Kinney in particular is quality hardwood trees that would likely uh, come down. We have a pretty strong uh, tree protection ordinance in Madison and while there is a carve out for public improvements and actually specifically says that public improvements should not be stopped um, because of the tree ordinance I'm, I'm not sure what they had in mind was 1.1 acres of, of deforestation. So I'm wondering if we can include, um, you know, tree replacement as part of, and I don't think we'd ever get close to the 1.1 acres, but make sure that tree replacement, should this project move forward, is, is an important component of that. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, you mean on the site or in another site? I mean, I, th I think, I can't, it would have to be a combination of both. I don't yeah. think you'd ever be able to get it. We'd all have to on. do some mitigation yeah. at, at, at another park pro parcel right. um, in Madison or very adjacent to the, the property. Um, and then I think my, well, I got two more. Uh, one is fencing. There are some great fence options shown um, in the connections. I'm assuming those are fences that the homeowners have installed um, and that the the fence that would be stock would be at like a chain link fence along the? Um, no, it's, okay. it's, you know, it's open to discussion about what fence it should be. Um, you know, I, 
I think the exception of the Liberty Green fence, which is that solid That one on the left here, that's the Liberty Green. Um, I, be I believe the Park Commission was um, partly responsible for that, but it's, it's open for okay. discussion Great. about what design details are selected. Um, you know, these amenity features are, are all still to be Great. And, and if a homeowner wanted from the jump, uh, a gate as part of that that could be included. Not allowed. In the project. They can't. No. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's part of the beauty to be able to walk out your back door yep. and embrace the trail that you have immediately outside your door. Great. And and I know we haven't designed phase three yet, but I'm just curious if there is um, future phases. I, I think it's been alluded to Elm Street is uh, and nothing against elm street but it's sort of like a trail to nowhere it, it kind of puts you there it's still a half mile from downtown um and, and actually puts if you go to the park avenue piece um puts you back onto park avenue basically in the only spot on park avenue that allows parking on the shoulder <laughs> <laughs> you're too fast i'm looking for that little blurb at the bottom it says, what? Oh, about the grant? Yeah, the, what's eligible for the grant? Um, there we go. I guess, in my mind, what I, I want to have more discussions of uh, with, with your different entities and, and committees is about how that connectivity that you're talking about and what opportunities, because we can include some of these other things in the grant. It's, it's, we can expand beyond the trail itself to make right. sure that those connections are exactly what we need them to be, where we need them to be. And those are going to involve local streets for the most part. Um, and we could potentially get you directly to the downtown if we so incorporate. The traction that. line property ends, though, and there's no further county right away behind Correct. from Elm, we, right, to Elm to James Park. Correct. No further right away. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Our and if we worked on it, we'd actually be better off because at Morris Avenue, at the other end, you end up on a very busy road one way going away from town. So you have, right. to, you have to walk your bicycle for a, yeah. uh, a block or two. That's the next grant. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for it. <laughs> no, but, but again, I think broadly, you know, conceptually, it, it's, it's a good it's it's a good idea and um but i think there's a lot of details got to be worked out between Absolutely. them all right so denise th thank you very much and obviously for everyone that's uh that come tonight and watching at home the um this is a big undertaking that uh it is very clear the benefits of uh trails and um whether it's for bikes or uh through the woods um but they, you know, it comes at a challenge, especially when, um, you know, it's 100 years between when the trolley stopped running and the uh, bikes start going. <laughs> uh, so that, that, that adds to it. So we'll have further discussions. But I, again, Denise, I want to thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, we will um, take you up on the offer of uh, sharing with the other committees. And just to let everyone know, you know, your, your work on trails, um, we love the trails in the rest of the county, but we love our trails right here in Madison. So, you know, Summerhill Park, uh, the, right now we're underway with creating the accessible trail at, the, at our MRC, which I've gotten um, already some emails from uh, residents at the Cheshire home asking about when that trail is going to be ready because there's so much looking forward to uh, an accessible trail that will not only take them through a small little wooded area, but to watch the uh, ball games that they say they enjoy. You know, our Memorial Park phase one will be going out to bid and then we're getting ready for phase two. So thank you so much that uh, we're, we're hoping that these habits that have changed during the pandemic will stay with us forever. And uh, that is walking more, biking more and taking care of our environment. So that's why we have these discussions. But as Eric said, the devil's in the details. So. Um, I think what we, uh, as discussed, we will pull uh, resolution 223 from the consent agenda. We'll have further discussions and um, to um, 
for your timing we'll be in communication as far as bringing it back in the fall again thank you for coming out tonight now we're uh, up for ordinances for hearing will the clerk please read the statement the ordinance is scheduled for hearing were introduced by title and passed on the first reading at the regular meeting of the council held on july the 25th 2022 all posted and filed according to law, and copies were made available to the general public requesting same. I call up for ordinances for second reading. I ask the clerk to say, read said ordinance by title. Ordinance 40-2022. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $455,000 from the General Capital Improvement Fund for the Madison Public Library Roof Restoration Project. I open the hearing. Anyone wishing to comment on Ordinance 40-2022, please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Mayor, I move ordinance 40-2022. Second. Any council discussion? Yes. I'd like to mention that, you know, that this is an important uh, step forward for the library. Once they complete their uh, roof uh, repair process, they can move forward with um, the renovation of the interior. And one thing I'd like to mention is that in speaking with the borough engineer about the specifications and design for the roof replacement, he confirmed that the spec should be written in such a way that it would not preclude the addition of solar panels in the future uh, should it be viable to add uh, solar photovoltaics to the roof of the library. So we're trying to be forward thinking about how we do this project and not uh, constrain ourselves from future improvements. Thank you. Any further comments? Roll call vote, please. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. I declare Ordinance 40-2022 adopted and finally passed and ask the clerk to publish notice there of a newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. Ordinance 41-2022. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $300,000 from the General Capital Improvement Fund for the Green Avenue Pedestrian Safety Project. I open hearing on Ordinance 41-2022. Anyone wishing to comment, please step forward. Um, my name is Elizabeth Vacchiano. I live at 68 Green Avenue. I've lived on Green Avenue 20 plus years. I started at a 32 Green at the bottom by Wilmer, and now I'm up at 68, which is by Hillside. I am in favor of the bump outs. It, it's something really necessary. Um, cars coming down Green Avenue towards Kings, it's a hill you really don't have a, a great line of sight when you hit that crosswalk a lot of people lose that use that crosswalk up at hillside um families kids you know coming you know from green village road side they come all the way over to the prospect side and when i used to live at 32 green my kids went to st vincent's and almost got hit by a couple cars myself with my kids because somebody would and i had a crossing guard um, crossing guard would stop a car and then somebody would come around and then almost hit us because they, they weren't waiting. So I, I think this is a great way to slow people down. Um, it's 25 miles an hour on green. No one really goes that fast. I do have some tractor trailer problems. They move between stop and shop and shop right. Um, I think that would slow them down even though they're not supposed to be on the road. Um, I, I just think it's going to be a great thing all the way around. I mean, the last person that, not the last the woman that was hit by the hit and run, but the young man that was hit in downtown, I know him. He is my, one of my daughter's friends. I know his family. Um, I don't want to see any more people hurt. I mean, I grew up here, and it's, it just breaks my heart um, to hear people getting hurt, whether they're coming here to shop or or they're visiting somebody that lives on green or whatever, I, I just really, really think this is a great thing to do for the safety of pedestrians and especially with all this traction line talk and we want people to walk, um, we have to protect them. And I, please, I really would love the bump outs on Green Avenue in that section. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Anyone else wishing to comment, please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Mayor, I move ordinance 41-2022. Second. Council discussion? Mayor. 
Yeah. yeah, I was wondering, in addition to the bump outs, which I understand they're made to slow people down, is there any thought to putting moderate speed bumps? Many towns have them, and I know that one way you can slow a car down is to put in the road bump and have a moderate speed bump going across the road that would end, let's say, where the cars would park. So if somebody's bicycling, they can avoid the speed bump. But bump outs, I know they can work, but I really believe that a speed bump, and not only on Green Avenue, but some other streets as well, might be a viable alternative. I know Green Village is in desperate need of something. When I moved there, right after that, a woman was hit and killed right there. So I don't know if it's part of this project or if it could be considered maybe for some other speedways in town. It's, um, it is not part of the project, yes. More, more often, more likely would be speed tables as opposed to speed bumps. As uh, Captain Joe Longo will of, often point out that the average life of a speed table is uh, three years because not, not because it, uh, damage, it gets eventually taken out by the communities to put them in. Obviously, there are some times where they are successful, but, um, you know, you... Um, all you need is <coughs> 10 landscaping trucks on a speed table in, uh, in an hour, which there's a lot of those in this town, and uh, all of a sudden the neighborhood is up. Okay. But this, this visual cue and this, this you know, a, a speed, speed bump is a, you know, somewhat of a visual cue, but, uh, you know, it's a little reminder that you better be slowing down. What uh, a bump outs do, as I mentioned at the last meeting, also reduce the time that a pedestrian is in the intersection uh, because they're yep, off the curb in yeah. a shorter time. It improves the sight distance for the uh, stop street that intersects, and so there's other advantages. Okay. Rachel? I just wanted to, you, you already picked up what on um, Captain Joe Longo says. This comes up on Complete Streets Committee, and he will tell you every time that more often than not, the residents ask them to be removed because people slow down for the bump and then gun it after they clear the bump which is dangerous and it provides a real nuisance, you know, to the neighbors hearing the bumping and the gunning of the engines and so forth. So ultimately they, uh, they, they tend to be removed and, and they don't serve their intended purpose. Um, he's got a lot of insight on that and if you want more information, I think he'd be happy to share that because it's, uh, he's really focused on traffic safety and how to make our roadways complete and work for all the users. No, I will speak with him about it because I have seen it then pop up in many municipalities. And if you have a nice car, uh, you're not going to want to go over that very fast and in danger of damaging your car. And whether they speed up or not, you know, if there's another one, you know, 100 yards down the road. Because I'm not talking about every street. I'm talking about the speedways in town. And you, you know which ones they are. And if as drivers know that every once in a while you can hit a speed bump, I don't think they're going to do the old New York City routine of drag racing in between speed bumps, you know, like they do in, uh, you know, between stoplights. But I will talk to Joe about it. I want him to compare it to other towns as well. Any other comments? Roll call vote, please. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. I declare Ordinance 41-2022 adopted and finally passed, and ask the clerk to publish notice there of a newspaper to file the ordinance in accordance with the law. Ordinance 42-2022. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison amending Ordinance 25-2022, appropriating $15,000 from the General Capital Improvement Fund for the replacement of hydraulic hoses and repairs to the fire department ladder truck to increase the appropriation from $65,000 to $80,000. I open hearing on Ordinance 42. Anyone wishing to comment, please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Mayor, I move Ordinance 42-2022. I second the ordinance. Council discussion? We'll call a vote, please. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. I declare Ordinance 42-2022 adopted and finally passed and ask the clerk to publish notice their newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. And now we're on to our second of uh, two invitations for comment, public comment. This is when you may comment on any topic. Again, same rules apply. Step up to lectern, state your name, 
address, uh, write the same on the sheet, and uh, try to keep your comments three minutes, but we'll give you one minute grace period. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Welcome, Joe. Joe Bavierchuk, 5 Beach Avenue, Madison. Um, I am here uh, to uh, express my um, uh, opposition to the Morris County Parks Commission plan to extend the traction line from Danforth Road to Elm Street. And my reasons for opposing this bike path are, number one, the extension would be very expensive. As we just heard, it would be three to four million dollars. Okay? And regardless of where the money is coming from, spending three or four million dollars on 0.62 miles of bike trail is just irresponsible. For the past five, six years, Morris County open space funds have been used to construct or improve trails in Morris County. It was reported that as January 2021, the county spent $3.3 million to improve or build 17.2 miles of trails. How can anyone justify three to four million dollars on a 0.62 mile trail extension when approximately the same amount of money can be used with 17 miles of trail? Two. The extension would be constructed very close to homes at 2 and 4 Beach Avenue and the home at 24 Cedar Avenue, which was the residence of the Lloyds, just and th thus impacting the privacy of these residents, especially the Lloyds. Having a public trail close to residents' homes could potentially impact the, their property values. Three. The trail could also affect the safety of area residents. There was an assault of a woman on the traction line earlier this spring in Morristown, and putting fencing on both sides of a narrow trail could make it very difficult for a person who was on that trail to flee an attacker. Four, the extension would increase water runoff from the area of the path, thus increasing the risk of flooding in the backyards of neighboring properties. The, the path would result in the creation of this project would result in the creation of a 10 foot wide paved path with a, a total of 32,500 square feet of, I mean, they, they say, well, maybe we can use a permeable surface or whatever, but I don't know how efficient that permeability would be. But it's also also the loss of all of the trees. And I'd walked it today and I would say, and I sent some pictures and I discussed it with Claire, you know, 75 to 100 trees easily because this is a very narrow path. It's the the right-of-way is essentially 30 feet. That's all they own. And they know that because I, got the, I have their survey from 2011. And all the removal of all of that is going to, that vegetation helps absorb rainwater. Uh, previously, there was a problem with increased water, run, water runoff from the direction of the train line in the area of 28 and 32 Crestwood. The land behind the backyards of the homes on Crestwood slopes up to the tracks. And so removing the trees from this area could re risk the integrity of the embankment behind the, homes, minute, behind the homes on Crestwood. No one I have spoken with in my neighborhood supports this bike trail extension. I respectfully ask that the council not consider supporting this path. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Anyone else wish to comment? Please step forward. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rebecca Feldman, and I have not been to a night meeting since I left Morristown Town Hall for corporate life at age 55 four years ago, to my surprise, after two years assisting the city administrator and eight sitting on the town council as the only nonpartisan, independent, elected official ever, I think, in the town of Morristown. I also live um, a block. In Washington's headquarters, I live one block from the traction line. We moved there um, in 1998, and in that time, I um, carried kids on the back of a bike. My parents pushed kids in a stroller. My kids learned to ride bikes. I've watched kids in high school run, um, and I watched the homes at Honeywell got, get built, and I thought, well, it's a lot more people using the trail. But right now, my daughter is a student at Fairleigh Dickinson University. Uh, pursuing a master's in organizational psych. I get to cavell a little bit. She lives on Park Avenue, 13 Park Avenue in Madison, above the old comic book store. Yeah. 
And I can tell you, since I do bike there, it's a little far for me to walk or run, um, that getting to that Elm Street access is easy. Park Avenue should be safer if the county's willing to help and can help get funding to make better road shoulders, clean it up a little, maybe some bump outs here and there, and mainly, in that case, signage. Getting from uh, the intersection of Ridgedale and Park, which frankly we all know is dangerous and could be improved, up to this location would be great. And I think that you can't judge how many people will use a bridge by how many people you see swimming a river. If you make this possible, people will use it. It's not about who from Morristown, who would like to come and get ice cream at McCool's and frankly can't, or who from the Honeywell development wants to go get coffee at Sunday Motor Company. But in fact, it's about all the residents on Elm Street and Park and Ridgedale who currently can't get to that trail because the entrance at Danforth is dangerous. Crossing Danforth is dangerous. I do it all the time. I ride 5,000 miles a year. But it's still not safe just by the nature of the grade, the change, and the speed of traffic coming from Park because of the projects there. You have college students, people working in Madison, people working in Morristown, people wanting to go to the Madison Farmer's Market. And right now it's difficult to do. I was helped found the Shade Tree Commission in Morristown. I was known as the mulch maven and on the cover of the Daily Record for showing people not how to over mulch their trees. And I'm most concerned about how to protect and save what large trees are along this route. But I can tell you that the damage to the trees on the traction line was done by JCPNL and New Jersey Transit. There's the, they're the ones who cleared the shade from that path. If this project could include replacing that shade in addition to building the extension, I think you'll be amazed at how many people do use it. And it won't be mostly people on bikes, frankly. It will be people walking and running. So I'm here to say I've been where you are. I live where you are. Um, and I hope that you can look to that future. And again, don't judge how many people are going to use this bridge by how many are swimming the river. It could be so easily made a terrific amenity, like the Randolph Trail System, that raises property values. I have to check my notes. Benefits the economy, improves public health, and above all, it builds community. Friends get out together and they walk there. People get on the phone and they call mom because they won't be interrupted and they don't have to worry about getting hit by a car at every corner. So I urge you to complete this vision that's been in existence since 1981 and um, make the best of it. It's going to be great for your town. And I'll meet you on the trail. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Anyone else wishing to comment? Please step forward. Good evening. Uh, Frank Spatola, 17 Kinney Street. Um, I just want to rehash, maybe rehash uh, certain things that uh, people have said tonight. Um, just to give you a little background, I was pre-three kids, big biker, 80 miles a day, uh, Boston to New York constantly for fundraisers don't, um, and all those things. So in any other situation, I'd love the idea of a rail trail. Most rail trails are made in abandoned rails, um, and they cost little to no money. Um, spending three to four million dollars on 0.62 Three to four million dollars on 0.62 miles seems ridiculous to me. Um, uh, I, I think the the speaker here mentioned uh, convent station foot traffic. Uh, excuse me, that there's a lot of foot traffic uh, on the current path. A lot of that has to do with convent station. I've seen where they've put the the foot traffic markers. Um, there's people that are going into the city, um, and I. I I guess a lot of the presentation today kind of gave me more questions than answers. Um, property values. Now, I know trail, there, there's been comments that say that property values increase because of trails. Does that include trails that have very busy rails next to them that are constantly used? Um, one. Uh, are the uh, increase in foot tra uh, the f it just seems like things haven't been uh, kind of thought out. So the three, four million dollars, it seems like there's still a lot of questions to um, to address. Um, so that's that's basically what I wanted to say tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. And here we
Good evening. Judy Kroll, 27 Laurel Way. I'm here tonight um, representing Friends of the Drew Forest. And I wanted to share with the council um, some information that's uh, uh, new for us. And I uh, want to let you know that uh, we're going to be sharing it more broadly on our website shortly. Uh, I want to let you know that Friends of Drew Forest retained the Davy Group, which is an um, environmental consulting firm, the legacy Amy Green environmental consulting firm. We retain them to organize, summarize, and synthesize a large number of documents related to the Drew Forest, which we had provided to them. And then, then supplemented that with uh, natural resources mapping that they created. And what they did was they gave us a report back, which, um, as I mentioned, we'll be uploading to our website in a few days. It provides a comprehensive narrative and context to the natural resources that are in the forest. So I'll share briefly with you some of the conclusions that they summarized for us near the end of the report, and then uh, a couple of interesting things that came up that were in the body of the narrative. The, in the conclusions they write, the preserve has limited development potential, but extremely high value as a preserved open space. The forest preserve provides many benefits, including but not limited to high charge area, high char recharge area for the Madison's drinking water, the Berry Valley Aquifer, which we all know about, rare native wildflower gardens that support healthy forests and food webs within and beyond the forest itself, habitat for forest fauna, aquatic wildlife, and habitat for the federally threatened and endangered species. Um, it's the Indiana bat that has been on the federal endangered species list since the early 60s. So uh, and we also know that the forest provides educational opportunities for students, for the public. It provides um, trails for all of us to enjoy. And of course, we know how valuable the trees are. So we knew a lot about, about many of those things. But I wanted to um, just share a couple of things that came up that I thought you'd find of interest. Um, Davey looked at a report that was done by a wetlands investigation firm called Equal Sciences. They were actually retained by Drew in uh, late 2020. They sent a report in early 2021. And they identified uh, five wetlands areas that they considered to be isolated. But Davey thinks that at least three of these wetland areas may be connected. And that would qualify them as exceptional uh, resource value waters, and that would increase the permitting requirements. Also, as I mentioned, uh, the, the, the uh, entire 53 acres is habitat for the Indiana bat. Um, and these bats use what's called vernal habitat, vernal habitat or wetlands that are not wet the entire year. They often are utilized by certain types of frogs and amphibians for... One minute. Uh, for... Um, Reproduction, they're not, they don't have fish so that the uh, animals can reproduce there. Anyway, David thinks that these wet, vernal wetlands would be also considered exceptional uh, by the New Jersey DEP. And again, stricter permitting would be required. So those are the things I wanted to share with you from the report. There's a lot more. Uh, but I want to let you know that Friends is still working uh, and hoping for a win-win solution. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And thank you again for the work. I don't have to sign in twice, right? I'm still Kathleen Cacavalli, and I still live at 82 Central Avenue. And I'm speaking on, oops, let me try this. I'm speaking on behalf of Gene Krakovia, chair of the Shade Tree Management Board, because he couldn't be here tonight. And he wanted to lift up a certain section that he read in the Davy report that Judy referenced. It highlights that there are a number of large trees in the Drew Forest which would qualify for the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection Big and Heritage Tree Registry, which we find very exciting. Madison is currently in the process of updating its landmark tree list, and many of the Drew trees would meet Madison's landmark tree criteria as well. The report also reinforces, and this is germane to the traction line as well as 
to the Drew Forest, that big trees provide 600 times, not six times, not 60 times, but 600 times the environmental benefits of typical trees in terms of their ability to remove pollution from the air, to remove carbon dioxide, to provide shade, to prevent water runoff, to reduce erosion and pollution, filter groundwater, provide wildlife habitat, increase property values, slow evaporation, and create natural sound barriers. And I just want to also raise up in relation to the traction line that <clears throat> removing a mature tree and replacing it with one, two, three, or six smaller trees does not provide the same benefit as that original tree that was removed. So I would encourage everyone who's considering the traction line. <clears throat> I mean, I'd love to see. I'm right with Rachel on reduced motor vehicle miles driven. I would love to see that there's a solution that um, would save most of the trees that count along that section. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Hi, Suzanne Schreiber. 106 Greenwich Court. Um, wow, I wasn't familiar with the traction line project, but three to four million, a lot of money. And um, also very interesting at a time that we're trying to save the forest, we're looking at taking, having all these mature trees taken away. It just seems wrong. Um, regarding the Drew Forest, I was curious as to the court hearing. I think it's set for the 19th, but I'm wondering if that's a public hearing. Um, because there have been people that have asked and can we possibly attend. Um, on another note, I, um, I mentioned last week I talked to a lot of people in the course of a week and at the last um, council meeting I expressed concern about um, some of the aggressive initiatives that are being pursued. And um, there is concern that there's the amount of discussion and also kind of lack of discussion regarding some of these initiatives. There seems to be a lot of praise and a lot of grateful commentary, but not a lot of challenges to some of the claims. So one of them, burning gas in our homes is hazardous to our health, especially our children. Really? I mean, for 33 years, I've been a resident and a taxpayer in Madison, and I've used natural gas to heat my home, my hot water, dry my clothes, cook my food. I like my gas appliances. And really, with the current interest rates, I'm not interested in changing to electric alternatives. And Mayor Conley, last meeting you stated if we don't act locally, the impact will be felt globally. And I am looking globally, and I'm thinking Germany and coal, firing up coal plants again, the Netherlands, Sri Lanka, and I'm thinking locally, and I'm concerned. So again, I say look at the science, focus on the economics, and I urge others to speak up and share your concerns because more discussion, more questions, more balance, it's going to be good for everyone. So I thank you. And that's it. Suzanne, thank you for your comments. And uh, for the court hearing, it is July 19th, correct, 11 a.m. in the court? August. Oh, August. I'm sorry, August. 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 Yeah. I probably put you uh, I'm just reading what Ray wrote for the record. <laughs> August, August, August 19th. Let me try that again. August, so August, there you are correct. It is August 19th, 11 a.m. in the courtroom of uh, Judge Stephen Hansbury, Marstown Courthouse, and it is open to the public. Well, I have a great project for the Morris County Parks Commission, uh, and I'm going to tell you something really interesting. Introduce yourself. Oh, I'm Claire Whitcomb, 12 Fairwood Road. Thank you. Um, and by the way, trees slow traffic. So uh, there's, there's an idea. Um, this has been an interesting day for Friends of the Drew Forest. Um, early this morning, we received a letter from Douglas O'Malley, the Director of Environmental Environment New Jersey, which is a major a statewide environment group, and um, it was co-signed by Jennifer Coffey, executive director of an organization I admire, being on the Environmental Commission, the Associate Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions, as well as Julia Summers, executive director of the New Jersey Highlands Coalition. Uh, by 5 p.m. today, uh, Greg Renard, uh, 
Baykeeper and CEO of New Jersey and New York Baykeeper had signed on. Bill Kilbler, Director of Policy from Raritan Headwaters Association, signed on. And um, Mike Pizzurro, Pub Policy Director of the Watershed Institute. So this letter um, is, begins, on behalf of six local, regional, and state environmental organizations, our hundreds of thousands of citizen members and activists, we wish to issue our vociferous report, support for the full conservation of the entire 53 acres of the Drew University Forest. There are many land use battles across the state, some that are waged with scant environmental evidence. This is not one of them. And the double whammy precedent of the potential development of such a unique ecosystem that the Drew Forest represents, along with the actions by a university hoping to cash out on one of its most treasured places compel us to action. We also want to clearly state that we have worked with the Town of Madison, Mayor Robert Conley, and the municipal environmental staff in the past, and it's clear that the Town of Madison values environmental protection and has created a record of sustainability that is unquestionable. I'm going to skip here. Drew Forest is in the same ecological complex as Geralda Farms Preserve, LaMonica Brook Reservation, and Great Swamp National Wildlife Dre Refuge, representing the work of thousands of people and many, many millions of dollars of generational investment. There is a legacy of restoration and civic engagement that complements the ecological importance of the forest. We strongly urge the Drew University, Drew University to protect its namesake forest through a conservation sale. There can't be a university in the forest without a forest. So that's uh, the cliff notes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing, Claire. My name is Michael Strange, uh, raised in Madison, um, and uh, own a home on Beach Avenue, um, one of the homes abutting the proposed uh, traction line project. One second here. Um, I'm not going to say too much that others haven't said. Um, I'm an active person. I, I bike, I keep in shape, and I love green spaces and, and, um, and bike trails. Um, but just as a reasonable person, um, I, I think the cost of this is, is absor exorbitant um, as, a, as a homeowner and uh, someone in the backyard abutting the property there. Um, uh, the privacy and the train buffer with the loss of the trees is a huge concern. Um, and, and just as a concerned citizen, um, the fact that the overall loss of trees and, and management of, of, of runoff and um, water in, in the area that uh, struggles with, with, um, with, with flooding if any of you have walked up Crestwood after a rain, it's, it's like a, a waterfall. Um, but based on the fact that those seem to be, in today's presentation, uh, an afterthought, um, I, I remain opposed to the, uh, to the project. Thank you very much, Michael. Hello, uh, Daniel Perrigan, 16 Kinney Street. Um, there were a couple of things in the presentation by the Parks Department that concerned me. Um, one, most of the slides showed very pretty green trails with trees on either side. And these are pictures of the other side of Danforth, the existing trail, where there's about 100 feet between the property and the track. There's a lot of land to use. There's a lot of way to wind these trails through trees. 30 feet strip on our side, where about 18 feet needs to be used for paving. There is no way to preserve these trees. They're all going to be coming down. And you could see they were dancing around. Uh, any questions involving how many trees need to cut down? And uh, there is going to be no way to preserve these trees. They're all going to have to come down for this project. So this will not be a green trail. It will be a hot, sunny, no shade trail with nothing but concrete and chain link fences. And it will not be a pretty place to bring your families into. Uh, the other thing that was very concerning is Mr. Range had a very valid question uh, about whether if this is approved and the planning goes on and a design is built, if there's something that is a deal breaker, can we get out? And they never did answer the question. They danced around it and said, we'll try to do our best to give you something you like. And I felt, think of everything that I heard today, that was the most alarming. Um, 
just a couple of points that uh, got my attention, and I thought I'd bring them to your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Anyone else wishing to speak? Um, Mary Wilson, 27 Sherwood, and this is what I came for. Um, I never noticed the Drew Forest um, until we were about to lose it. Um, and I don't understand why this isn't on the forefront of every meeting here as to what our plan is. I've learned several things over the course of the last few meetings um, about why it's so valuable, but I don't know what the plan is. If the conservancy sale doesn't work, and I don't know if I pronounced that word correctly, if that doesn't work, what is our plan B? I hope we don't spend a dime on any other environmental issue in this town until we figure out what's going on with the Drew Forest. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mary. Yeah. And certainly it is high, and um, while we can't share everything, we are working diligently. Anyone else wishing to comment, please step forward. Uh, <clears throat> Jamie Jimenez, 15 Park Avenue. And um, just want to make a few comments in regards to uh, the open space that's going to be acquired at Geralda Farms. Um, Tom, in the last meeting, had made a comment about pickleball courts. Um, I'm an avid golfer, and I would love to the township to consider, as part of the open space committee, uh, perhaps a nine-hole municipal uh, run golf course. Um, there's been successful golf courses uh, in nearby Milburn and also Summit. Um, and I think it would be a benefit not only financially to the township, but also a great use of the open space that is to be established at Geralda Farms. Thank you, Gene. Thank you. Yeah, just a, as a clarification, there is no available open space at Geralda Farms. The, um, there is a, a park that was created recently um, by the Morris County Park Commission on the open space that's available. The rest of it is all in the hands of... Um, um, private uh, ownership. The conversation about pickleball courts was at the MRC, which is the right. facility uh, at, at, by the high school. Anyone, any, anyone else wishing to comment? Please step forward. Seeing none, I close this part of the meeting. And there are no introduction of no, no ordinances to be introduced, so we move on to consent agenda resolution. Will the clerk please read the statement? Consent agenda resolutions will be enacted with a single motion. Any resolution requiring expenditure is supported by a certification of availability of funds. Any resolution requiring discussion will be removed from the consent agenda. All resolutions will be reflected in full in the minutes. Mayor, I move resolution 212-2022 to resolution 222 and then resolution 224 to resolution 228. Second. Any council? Second. Mm. Any council discussion or any that need to be um, pulled? Roll call vote, please. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. There is no unfinished business. Pool of vouchers. Will the clerk please read the voucher totals? The current fund, $248,649.85. General capital fund, $818.40. For the electric operating fund, $144,373.34. And from the water operating fund, $2,512.67. For the trust, $53,331.58. The total is $449,685.84. Mayor, I move the approval of the vouchers. Second. Any discussion? Second. Uh, roll call vote. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. The only uh, new business is a reminder that this is our only meeting for the month of uh, August. We will, our next meeting will be September 12th. Hopefully it'll be a lot cooler. <laughs> right. With that? Mayor, I move we uh, adjourn the meeting. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all. Thank you, Maureen.